This is Make Something Cool. I'm Alex Sugg. Today, I am very excited to be sitting down with Brian McDonald about the art of storytelling. And Brian is the chief storyteller at Belief Agency. He's also an award-winning screenwriter, author, director, teacher, producer, and consultant. He's worked in film, television, and comic books for more than 30 years. And he's helped giants like Pixar, Disney, HBO, and many others tell better stories. Brian, I am so excited to have you here. Thanks for being on. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. I think one big reason I wanted to have you on is because I think the word story is pretty underrated right now. It almost it, it, it's kind of thrown around almost like love, yes. you know, like I love cheese or I love whatever random thing. It's like you don't really love it. I actually it's just do kind of love a fill- cheese, but that's another that's another. <laughs> yes, yeah. Actually, I do too. <laughs> yeah, Maybe a bad example. Yeah, it was a terrible example, but I know what you mean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. But I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. Like lo- love is such a loose word now to where a lot of times I don't, I don't think we really mean it all the way. And I think story is similar where it's kind of thrown around a lot or even saying like, I'm a storyteller or whatever that means. I think it's just kind of vague now and it's kind of lost its power. But over the past few years, I've really just come to terms with like, I think the entire game of life and being human is about stories, both those that we tell ourselves and those that we tell the world and those that are told to us. Um, It's kind of the thing that pins our reality up and kind of it it upholds what we do in in life. So I think it's a good, as a place to start, what is a story? Like maybe let's start there. Well, that's a good question. It's the first question I ask when I teach because uh, when uh, I work with corporations or well, anybody really, I find that people don't have a definition. And I, I hear people use the word story and throw it around kind of like what we're talking about without actually having a definition. So they'll say, well, anything mm. can be a story and everything's a story. And it's like, that's not true. That, that means it has no definition. It actually has a definition. And yeah. here's what I think is important about understanding that, first of all, when I'm working with brands or anything like that, it's like, well, well, again, or anyone, it's like, well, if you don't know what a story is, then how do you know you're doing? It? Mm. Right. And years ago, I was listening to an interview with a jazz musician. He's a jazz bassist. And apparently very, you know, very sought after, very uh, highly thought of bassist. And the interviewer was asking him, well, how did you get to be the bassist that everybody thinks is the coolest bassist? And he said, well, I was a bassist for a while and I was pretty good. But he said, one day I decided to look up bass in the dictionary. And he said, I looked it up and a bass is a foundation. Everything is built on the bass. Once I understood the definition I got better at my job because I knew what I was supposed to do. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm like, I'll look up the word story. I think I probably looked it up before this, but anyway, I, I, I'm not sure the chronology, but anyway, I looked up the definition of story once and it has a very, it has a very specific definition. And I was like, Oh, okay. That's good. Because all these things that people are saying are stories. Like sometimes people will say uh, a mood is a story or mm. uh, an attitude or uh, a way of thinking or mm. a worldview. And those aren't stories. And so here, before I give the definition, the other thing that you have to know about how dictionaries are written, a lot of people don't know how dictionaries are written. How you write a dictionary is this. They, they you know, have a bunch of words and they go ask people they think are smart people, word people, what do you think this mm-hmm. means? And they get a consensus, which is why you get mm. in the dictionary a one and a two. And it's like most people said this, some people said this, right? Because that's the way they write dictionaries. Right. Also because words change over time, right? So it may mean something mm. 100 years ago and mean something else now, right? The word drama has changed like that, for instance. It's a, it means something mm. different than the way people use it. But because drama, comedy was also drama when the Greeks created drama. Comedy and drama are this uh, are comedy. Comedy and tragedy are drama. Okay. Right. We mean drama as, you know, serious. We're really talking about tragedy. Right. 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 But, right exactly. Yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, and it, it's just a personal thing with me. It kind of makes me crazy, but, but <laughs> that we use it wrong. <laughs> right. But that's yeah. just, that's just because I have that knowledge base. And so, For yeah. Sure. yeah. But anyway, so the definition of story was in the dictionary. I forget which dictionary. The series. Or the, I'm sorry, the telling or retelling of a series of events 
leading to a conclusion. Well, mm. I should say I added leading to a conclusion. So it's the telling okay. or retelling of a series of events. And I was like, yeah, that's not exactly right. Now, right. because I knew how they wrote dictionaries, I was like, oh, they asked a bunch of word people what they thought story was, but they mm. didn't ask people who actually write stories what they thought story right. was. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it makes you wonder about the rest of the words. Well, it, you know, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that other people with other expertise might say yeah. that's not quite the definition, right? People conflate words and storytelling. And so they think that word people are story people and they're not necessarily, mm. which is one of the reasons speaking of definitions, I don't like that we use the same verb for physically writing as storytelling. Mm, because right. people think if they're good with words, they're good storytellers. And that's not necessarily true. Right. And wor stories don't even need words. Right. Right. Charlie Chaplin had a whole career, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. The first 30 years of movies, you know, there were very few words, totally. right? So pantomime, there's all kinds of things. You don't need words to tell a story. So mm. this conflation, I, I'm not a big fan of, but I want to say why I added leading to a conclusion at the end of the definition. All stories have a point, a reason to be told. They are going somewhere. So leading to a conclusion, not meaning having an ending, but having a point, conclusion. Right. That's this, a good distinction. Yeah, this and this equal this, right? Right. So that's that's the definition that I work from. Yeah, and that leaves open space for like open endings too. Because if it were like the conclusion or whatever, I think that if it, I, I like that you don't, it's more the point can be, you walk away maybe not knowing how a story ends, but you have a, a sense of what it's about. There's a point to it still. Well, yeah. Endings endings are interesting. They are. I would love yeah, let's talk about You want to talk about endings? <laughs> really quick. Yeah. yeah okay. I'm, I'm curious about it. Well, endings are I, I I talk about story map a lot, that stories have a sort of logic that I, I think of as story map. And so it's like this we can talk about act structure, but Act one is one thing, act two is another thing, and act three is what that equals. So this plus this equals this. It's been defined as, uh, well, just like writing a paper or anything, you have, uh, you have your thesis, you have your mm. antithesis, and you have your synthesis. This plus mm. this equals this, right? right? And so an ending is not a thing that exists on its own. An ending is what these other two, two things add up to. Right. Right. And so if an open or ambiguous ending makes your point, then it's perfectly legitimate. But mm. if it's a lazy way of not finishing. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Which a lot of people use it for because they don't have anything to say, but they think if they're writing words, they're writing, then they get to the end. They go, well, I'm not going to say what the ending is because really, because they don't right. know. Right. Exactly. Um, right. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So it has to be making your point. If your mm. point is life has no point, has no meaning, you still have to prove that just like you would anything else. Right. Right. You can't just have a thing, an incident, and then end it and go, you know, well, that's because life has no, it's like, nah, you just cheated. Right. I used to work with a guy when I was sort of first starting and he was an animator, illustrator guy, and his parents were both musicians like classical musicians. Mm. And we would listen to, you know, we'd listen to music as we were working, we worked in an animation uh, studio. And uh, some song we were listening to, you know, from the 60s or something, it sort of faded out at the end, you know, the lyrics sort of just faded. And he said, you know, my parents hate that. And I'm like, why? And he goes, well, because it's a cheat. And that stuck with me because at the time I was 20, oh, it wasn't even, I might've been 20. I was like, oh, does that make, it stuck with me. And the more I thought mm. about it, the more sense it made. Like, yeah. oh, you didn't know how to end, so you just faded out the sound. You just faded yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, you know? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's really, really good and interesting to think about. I think that kind of leads me to to something I've heard you talk about is that and it and when you said this, like I've always been interested in storytelling and the idea of thinking th about story in a context of life. Mm -hmm. But on your on your podcast, you are a storyteller for belief agency. You talk about stories being survival information. Mm -hmm. Can we dig into that? What do you what do you mean that stories are survival information? Well, here's the thing. You have to think about the idea that in the history of humanity, mm. in the, in all of human history, in every culture, there has never been 
a group of people who didn't tell stories. Never. Well, why would that be? Why would it be that we all do it? Well, it's the same thing it must have been selected for, Mm. right? Whoever, if they didn't tell stories, they're not here now, right? So it must have been selected for. Mm. And anything selected for is selected for because it helps us survive, right? Right. Yeah. So it's not like, for instance, I, I hear people say something. Sometimes they'll talk about the oral tradition, right? They'll say, oh, I know that's before they wrote things down, they had the oral tradition. I don't know who came up with that. It's stupid. And here's why I think it's <laughs> stupid. Mm-hmm. It is so innately human. It's not a tradition. Right. Right. Yeah. It, a tradition mm. is Thanksgiving. Right. Eating is not a tradition. Right. So, right. So yeah, it's a great, great distinction. Right. And so it's like, oh, no, that's not a true. Tr- but people say it, they, they hear something. It sounds right. They repeat it for 100 years or 200 years. And it's like, you know what? That doesn't actually make any sense. Yeah. And so there's it is innately human to tell stories. And if it mm-hmm. has to do with survival information, passing on survival information, that would make sense. And if you ask any writing teacher anywhere, they will tell you that stories need conflict. Right. Stories mm-hmm. have to have conflict. They're not interesting without conflict. You have to have... Now, I remember hearing that as a kid in school, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade or something and, and asking why. And the teachers would always say, well, it's just more interesting if there's conflict. And I was like, well, that right. that's not really an answer. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, right, some people yeah. are OK with that. I was not OK with that. No, there's got to be a reason. Well, looking, you know, at it for several years, it's like, well, of course, it makes sense. Because conflict is the thing that we're trying to survive. Right. Right. That's why it's innately right. interesting. Right. Right. We don't have to worry about the good times. Right. Right. Yeah. We can survive those pretty well. And so, yeah, that's why it's innately interesting to us. Right. And the other thing is you can see it. Uh, you can see the way that people use stories in life. If you start listening, you'll hear people passing on survival information. And when I say survival, what often happens is people put it in a very specific context of a physical survival. Right. Right. But there's yeah. all kinds of survival, right? So mm. there's emotional survival or spiritual survival, right? Uh, a lot of 12 step programs would be like that where people are sharing mm. stories about getting through a hard time and it's an emotional mm. thing that's helping you survive. Yeah. Right. So there's um there's cultural survival this is the culture this is how we do things blah 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 right there's social survival right. don't be mm-hmm. a jerk you know what i mean there's all kinds totally. of, there's all kinds yeah. of survival so um but in the end it's always about some kind of survival yeah yeah but you can look and you, you'll hear it if you start listening for it you'll hear it in the way people speak to each other and that's another thing to think about when we think about stories and storytelling we tend to formalize it. So we tend to think of it as something in a book or on a stage, or um, often I I would say to people, I would talk about, I would rather call myself a storyteller than a writer, but people put storyteller in a certain box. Sure. Right. So when I would say storytelling to people, they'd say, Oh yes. Uh, They would think about children's storytelling, you know, Mm -hmm. telling stories to kids, or they would talk about, uh, think about tribal storytelling. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. And they put it in a box mm. for, without thinking that you tell stories every day in your everyday life. You tell stories. When I totally. am trying to give you the definition of story itself, I tell you the story about the jazz musician. Mm. Right? right. We do it all the time. Right. And so it, when we start to realize that it's the water we're swimming in and that it's everywhere, it changes how you listen and, 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 and observe that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're everywhere. And in fact, we are such ravenous consumers of story. We can't get enough of it. We can't. Uh, so yeah, yeah you, you've got conversations or their stories and uh, maybe you have a long day at work and you come home. What do you do? You engage in a story to relax, right? Right. You, you, you watch a movie or a TV show or you, you read a book or, you know, whatever it is, but you will engage a podcast, you will engage in stories. Yeah. Right. So it's like, why would they be so pervasive if it didn't Mm. have to do with survival? It doesn't make sense. Right. Right. It doesn't make sense. And, oh, I was going to say, you can see it with children. 
the way children gravitate towards stories. When you tell a bunch mm-hmm. of kids it's story time, the excitement, right, that kids yeah. have. Oh, yeah. And I think that's because children are new to the world and they need to figure out how it works. And stories right. are a way to get that. And I think that's why stories so often go from older to younger, older to younger. Mm, yeah. No, that's so good. Yeah. And it's just, it's true. I think you're right. When I've heard you talk about it before and the more I've thought about it, just really seeing it everywhere. And I think too, like with the, we talked, you know, on this show, we've talked a lot about social media, the use of it, uh, getting more out of it. And instead of, you know, using it a little bit more than letting it use you. Mm -hmm. But I think in so many ways, it's like storytelling. That's a huge part of the addiction of social media is it's all these little mini stories everyone's telling all day. And, and the reason we get addicted to that is, to your point of what you said is just in, we have this insatiable appetite for more stories, more stories, more stories, yeah. more stories all the time. And it's almost like, yeah, it could be survival. It's like good. It feels good to our brains to be taken on these little journeys, whatever it is, even if it's like a, I don't know, 10 character tweet or whatever, right. like that's a little mini story we're engaging with. And so it's just, when I started to see the world that way, I'm just like, Oh, we are like, to your point, it's the water I swim in. It's just everything I encounter is some sort of story is really interesting. I think you you've talked a lot about the 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 kind of core of story and you you've you have a title called the armature. And I think you've talked about it on your podcast at length, but I, I think for my listeners, maybe let's give a brief overview of what you mean by the what the armature is in a story. Mm-hmm. And let's just go deep into how, everything that it kind of symbolizes and how it works to make a story either work or not work like how it becomes engaging or not engaging i think the armature is really kind of the core of how that that works Mm -hmm. uh well i will tell you how i how i came to use the term how i you know so when i um early on in my career i worked in creature shops in in, for movies so um my roommate uh, was a guy named todd masters who is a special effects makeup artist and we had known each other in Seattle and then he moved to LA before me. And then I moved in with him. And so he knew a lot of other creature people. So I ended up getting jobs in creature shops when I first got to LA. And this was a creature shop. hmm? What is a creature? I will will explain a a creature (laughs) shop was, um, this is in the days before CGI. Mm -hmm. This is in the eighties and mid eighties and b- before CGI, you had to actually build things like you had to build ET or you had to build, you know, the, the, like mm-hmm. predator or whatever you, they, they had to get built right, uh, and made and fabricated and they were physical. And mm-hmm. so creature shops is where they made those things. And so, uh, yeah. So, uh, in fact, when I first moved to LA, my roommate was working on the movie predator. Um, okay. yeah. So we had like props around the house and stuff from, that's perfect. awesome yeah it was that's an epic movie to work on it, yeah it <laughs> was cool. uh, it was called hunter at the time i still have the script because he had it oh, yeah that's cool. anyway so i got to be around all of these sculptors and and crafts people and these and these sculptors uh would sculpt a little mini version of whatever creature you know so the director could see it and the you know just some model of it so that everybody right. could reference it and it, they were amazing sculptures, like really beautiful. Yeah. And they, there's a wireframe armature that you make that's the skeleton that everything hangs on. Mm. And I was asking about it and I was told, uh, oh, yeah, you have to do that because if you don't do that, the clay can't support its own weight and it'll, it'll collapse in a day or two or sometimes a couple hours. It'll just kind of fall over or implode. So, mm. uh, so you need this skeleton. Right. And so... That is one of the most important parts of the sculpture, but it's not, it's not a part anybody notices when the sculpture is done, right? They see the surface, right? A story has an armature and it's, everything is built around this armature and it supports everything. And without it, everything collapses, right? And the armature of a story is the point of the story, Mm. the reason to tell the story, right? And so once you have that reason, we, we naturally do it when we're telling a story. And in fact, when people aren't doing it, when people don't have an armature, you quickly get bored. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. You're, you start going, I don't understand where this is going or why you're telling me this mm-hmm. or what, you know, when there's an armature, it's a whole different thing. 
right? Uh, right? So, so the people who can hold your attention usually will have an armature. Right. They're, they're hanging it on this one idea. So, yeah, the armature, I mean, if you think about it in terms of Aesop's fables, it would be the moral. Uh, right. But moral has a bunch of connotations that people seem to rebel against. But it doesn't have to be moral. It just has to be the reason you're telling it. <laughs> right. Right. So, for sure. And, yeah. and that that informs every decision you make along the way. If you have mm-hmm. a strong armature, then that will determine what kinds of characters you create to help prove that point or disprove that point. You can, you can prove or disprove an armature people. It's the same thing as a theme, Yeah. but I don't like to use the word theme because theme like story is a word that people have different definitions for. And if you just start saying theme and you know, this person over here has a definition and this person over here has a definition. Now you're not even speaking the same language anymore. Right. Right. So armature is a way of sort of giving a definition to something. (laughs) For people right. and then saying, okay, you can also say theme, but often I find that people don't understand theme. So people will say the theme of a particular story might be revenge. They go, the theme is revenge. It's mm-hmm. not a theme. Revenge mm-hmm. can't be a theme uh, or um, it's hate or it's whatever it is, friendship, whatever it mm-hmm. is, those single word uh, themes can't be themes because you can't prove them or disprove them through the course of the story. Hmm. So what you, what you're doing, what you, what you need is a sentence. Okay. So what you can say is if you seek revenge, dig two graves, right? You can prove that, Mm. right? Yeah. You can prove that revenge harms the Avenger, right? You can prove, you can't prove friendship, but you can prove that friendships are sometimes difficult or friendships are necessary or friendships are worth the trouble or whatever it is you want to prove. Right. But you can't prove friendship. So sometimes people say, well, that's the theme of the thing, friendship, because they were friends. It's like there were friends in the thing, but right. that doesn't mean that's what it's about. Right. Yeah, you know, totally. And people often confuse that critics are the worst offenders. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I think it's so when I first heard you explain this, it felt like the most aha moment of all time, just like so incredibly clarifying, too, because I think you've spoken about like working from the inside out versus from the outside in. Mm-hmm. And and I think working from the inside out, like having this centerpiece of what, in this case, the armature using that term, what am I trying to say? And then every other piece of whatever story or creative project or whatever it is you're working on is then informed by that centerpiece. Mm-hmm. And if it's not informed by that centerpiece, it doesn't belong. Right. So there's, I want to talk about like editing Mm -hmm. in in a little bit, because I think like the editing process, especially when you have the armature in mind is like vital. But I really think like at the core of this idea of the armature, like maybe I I remember you talking about Jaws Mm -hmm. and it really blew my mind because, you know, if you ask somebody, what is Jaws about? Maybe you should just tell the story. What is Jaws about? Well, let me, okay. So here's the thing about Jaws. So Jaws came out in 1975. Okay. And in 1975, yeah. I was 10 years old. My mother would not let me see Jaws. I'm still a little upset about this. So, okay. so, so <laughs> uh, because it, we, I, it, it's hard to explain to people who weren't there. It's true of the first Star Wars movie, too. If you weren't there, you have no idea the impact it actually had. It was mm. like the shot heard around the world. Like you, I, I it was back then, it, there, sure, there was advertising, but the hype back then was generated by audiences, right. not by studios. Sure. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean studios yeah. might capitalize on the hype, right? Of course, <laughs> right. yeah. But it was a very natural buzz of like word of mouth. People are just yes. excited enough to tell their friends and tell their friends and so on. That, way. that used to be part of the marketing strategy. Strategy. Yeah. They wanted word of mouth. So they, they, right. they thought, well, if you make a really good movie that's entertaining, that engages people, they will tell their friends. You know, you're not talking no internet, no, you know, it's just people telling their friends, you got to see Jaws or ET or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was very different. And the, the, the hype was different and it's hard to explain Mm -hmm. to people who weren't there what it was like, but Jaws was pervasive. It was everywhere. And I really wanted to see Jaws. Yeah. But mom, mom was like, it's too intense. It's too intense for kids. I, I believe to this day, had I seen it, yeah, it would have been intense, but I also was enough of a film guy. I was already a film Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
that I would, it would have impacted my imagination in a way that I'm sure it would still be working on me as a lot of things did back then. Like I saw Planet of the Apes and that has still is in there. Um, mm-hmm. and I think it would have been one of those defining things. Sure. But it ended up being a defining thing in a different way. So, uh, so in the meantime, the ability to watch movies at home shows up. We get VCRs and VHS and stuff, right? So, because Jaws would come on TV after that, but I'm like, I'm not watching it on TV. I didn't want to watch it cut up. I didn't want to watch it with commercials in it. I wanted to have the experience. So, so when I'm 16 or 15, I see Jaws and I'm like, oh my God, this, I I think it must've been 15. I was 15 because I had seen the movie Altered States and I could go on about that. But anyway, Patty Chayefsky, who wrote that movie said, Oh, that's really just a love story. And it blew my mind at 15. Like how, but it's this mm. guy who transforms into a creature and like, how could it be a love story? It didn't make any sense to my brain. I think it was shortly after that, that I saw Jaws for the first time. Yeah. And I watched Jaws and I was like, Oh, this isn't about a shark at all. Right. <laughs> and, I, right. and I remember going to school the next day talking about how great Jaws was. And everybody's like, we all saw it five years ago. We're really, I was just going to ask. Yeah. So you're the one guy who hadn't seen Jaws I was Jaws the guy who hadn't seen years. it, yeah. But, but, <laughs> gotcha. but yeah. what I got from it was something I wouldn't have gotten at 10, which right. is what I got from it is I, I'm like, oh, my God. Here you have in that story, you have the sheriff who is afraid of the water. That's his whole thing. He's afraid of the water. Mm-hmm. And his very last line in the movie after going through this experience is – You know, I used to hate the water because what he did was face his fear and conquer his fear. The the Mm. shark is just giving the water teeth. Right. Right. That's all that's happening. there, And and so the whole the whole thing is, look, aliens has the same thing. Face your fear, conquer your fear. Mm. Right. Ripley's having nightmares. Right. In, In that movie, she's plagued by the memory of what happened to her crew and these aliens. And then she faces the queen alien. And her very last line, she not, the beginning of the movie, she's having nightmares. End of the movie, she's she's happy to sleep. She's going into hypersleep. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, there's a whole thing. So, Jaws is not just about a shark because it wouldn't be Jaws then. It wouldn't be a movie that we're still talking about. That can't, you know how many movies came out in 1975 we don't right. talk about? Right. <laughs> right, right. For sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we still talk about that one. Yeah. So Jaws is about a man facing his fear of the water. It's not about a shark. Yeah. And I would say facing his fear. I, sometimes okay. I sometimes if you get too specific, then you, what happens is you don't understand that you could because it, it, for, I'll give you an example. So Frank Darabont, who, you know, uh, made Shawshank Redemption, wrote that screenplay and directed that movie. Now, that's that armature is uh, get busy living or get busy dying. Right. Mm. And there are th- that's shown in the movie a lot of ways. It's it's illustrated all over the place. And so um, Andy Dufresne in that movie is has this kind of almost supernatural optimism. Mm. It's hard to get Andy down because even though he's in prison and things are bad, he's always getting busy living. Right. Right. Uh, and so and you see it demonstrated a lot. Well, what's interesting is that Frank Darabont got a lot of uh letters from people who are going through hard times this helped me through my divorce this helped me through this this helped me through that well if it had just been about prison right it, right that's too specific right mm-hmm. the story can be specific but the armature is more general than that get busy living mm-hmm. or get busy yeah. dying right right um, yeah, that transcend that transcends the details right that's the, yeah so that's why i would say yes jaws is about a guy getting over his fear of the water but really it's about a guy facing his fear and conquering his fear mm. that's more important right because you can take that armature and make a whole different story out of it it's true <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, yeah yeah so what happens when you don't have an armature like what happens if you don't have because i think you you have to that has to be your starting point right like you I, if you don't start there, then, then you, you kind of end up there. Maybe is that how it works? Or do you just kind of end up in no man's land a little bit? Here's here. There's a, one of the things about being a storyteller, I think that people don't understand or it, from it, you know, that's my opinion is that the reading experience is different than the writing experience. And mm-hmm. a lot of times people write 
to get a reading experience. So that means right. I don't want to know what happens. I don't know want to know what's going on. I don't want to know what's like, well, then read a book. You're writing a book right now, right? right? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And they're different experiences. And so it, it makes people feel like, well, if I know what's going on, it's not as much fun for me. If I know where it's going, if I know what these characters mean, if I know it's not as much fun for me, well, they're trying to have a reading experience. Right. But what happens is it's very clear. It's less clear to people now because I think there's a lot of bad stories out there. But um, mm -hmm. it becomes very clear that there's some meandering and the, the, the writers don't know where the thing is going. And, and um, I, for like, it's really easy for me to see. And I remember when Lost was a big show, the show Lost was a huge show. Mm -hmm. I watched half of the pilot and I said, this show doesn't know where it's going. Doesn't know what it's about. Mm. And everybody told me I was insane. Yeah. No, you haven't watched it. You got to watch, you know, and the more they told me, the more I went, it doesn't know. It's just throwing things out there and it won't work in the end. Everybody knows it didn't work in the end. Oh, I'm disappointed. <laughs> it's like, yes, they didn't have a point. They didn't have a plan. Mm. Right. Right. The other thing about not having a plan, because we've gotten into this idea that the surprise is the thing. If you don't have a plan and you're surprised as the storyteller by the ending, I mean, you can have some surprises in a story. I don't, I, yeah. as you create it, things come up. I get that. That is part of it. That's part of any creative process. I think, I don't think you can, yeah. you, you, you can't be too rigid, but I right. think there's, there's, there's a balance. Yeah. You know, um, and some people go, I think, too far the other way and don't want to have any control over it. And it just goes where it goes and it does what it does. And but it ends up meandering and yeah. um, it's a it's a waste of everyone's time. I think. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like the difference of knowing what you're trying to say versus not knowing what you're trying to say yep. in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. My background's in music and I I grew up. I grew up playing music, loving music a lot. And my, my older brother, he's like into very weird music. So he's into very like abstract, we or he was more in high school. Okay. <laughs> he's kind of mellowed sure. out a little bit, but very, very like strange uh, music that you, you wouldn't find in, in your top, top 100 billboard type music at all. Very abstract, very weird experimental. And I, and I started getting into that in my early teens. And then in my late teens, I started to really discover the, how hard it was to write a simple, good song. Right. And what I, what I learned was, and we still argue to this day about it is that you can, it's so much easier to be abstract or to be weird or to be unclear yes. than it is to write, you know, a Drake hook, like, like my brother he'll, he'll, or whoever who's, yeah. he doesn't, he's not a fan of Drake or Taylor Swift or whoever, you know, you know, and they hardly write their songs. Other people do a lot of that form, sure. but, but it's, it's the point of like, it takes so much more effort to get that cl clarity to where a hundred million people can understand and sing along with one thing. Like that is so much harder to achieve than just making something really weird and abstract and, and noodling on your guitar for an hour. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there's, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yip Harburg and uh, Harold Arlen were writing the, songs for the wizard of oz hmm. they had all the songs written except for dorothy's song except the you know they didn't have that song and they were trying to figure it out and harold arlen starts playing this sort of sweeping melody and, and it's like well man, i don't know i don't know and he's like no i think it'll work and I'm like i don't know so anyway so uh they called up irving berlin who was you know a big famous songwriter very successful and they call him up and they go hey can we come run this song by you. He's like, yeah, come on over. So they went over there. And so Harold Arlen starts playing the song and uh, over the rainbow, but it's a sweeping thing. And Irving Berlin said, uh, okay, stop. Play it with one finger. If you can play it with one finger, it'll work. Mm. That's, That's such a good rule. Isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <I> guess. <laughs> yeah. The most iconic soundtracks or songs or whatever it is, if you can play the melody with one finger, that's that's how you know it'll stick. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's what amazes me so much about John Williams, actually. True. That John Amazing. Williams, like he can take a few simple notes that you cannot separate from the movie. It becomes as much part of the movie as it. I mean, bump, 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 like 
You did that? Oh my gosh, like, I know. That didn't exist, yeah. and then you made that? Or Jaws? It's only two notes in Jaws. Boom, boom, mm. boom, 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 faster or slower. Boom, boom, boom. Yep. It's two notes. That's how you, I think, do something iconic. And it's, it's, you know what? It's focused. It's not hiding. I think sometimes when people use a lot of yes. details, they're hiding. It's to hide. It's yeah. to hide. It's details not, or abstraction. Yeah. It's making not, it very abs- yeah. It's not decisive. Yes. Because you can be judged for being decisive. That's very true. Yeah. Being decisive and being, being uh, very clear is very vulnerable. It is. Because a lot of people can just say, you're stupid and wrong. I don't agree with you. Right. But if it's just abstract and unclear what you're saying, no one can agree or disagree. Right. It's just kind of there. Yep. But it doesn't actually move anyone either. No. Um, it doesn't really affect or change anything. I think that, that, yeah, I think that kind of brings me into like the editing process. Cause I think so much of like accidental abstraction, even if it's not, um, and I think this applies to like basically all creative work, is the, the art form of editing your own work is so hard, but it's so vital because I think we all have different tastes. We all have different things we think are cool. Like I've heard you and Jesse talk about it for filmmaking is a great example where. I think like I have a bunch of friends who are DPs, directors of photography. They're great with cameras mm-hmm. and they can nerd out on like this very specific shot and how it, how yes. it zooms in and how it does all this stuff and the color and the lighting and all this stuff. But the truth of the matter is if it's not serving your story, it's actually hurting your story by including those things, no matter how cool or tasteful or whatever it is that you feel about it. If it's not serving the story, then you should cut it. That process is really hard to do. How, how, how do you approach that? Or how do you, how do you, yeah. I, I, I will, I will get to that, but I, it reminded me of something. So I, okay. when I teach visual storytelling, when I'm teaching mm. screenwriters and I'm teaching visual storytelling, there's a shot in the movie, The Verdict, which a lot of people don't know now, but it was uh, 1982. It's a legal drama with Paul Newman. It's a really good movie written by David Mamet, uh, directed by Sidney Lumet. But uh, The Verdict has in it one of my favorite shots in movies, in Mm. all of movies. And nobody would pick it out and go, oh my God, what a beautiful shot. Because it's clear, it's just a storytelling shot. Mm. And it's a beautiful storytelling shot because of how well it tells. So I'll, I'll stop, I'll pause the, I'm showing other things, but I pause and I just point this out. There's a shot. So you sort of see, uh, that Paul Newman's character is kind of um, a shady lawyer. That's one of the okay. that's the first things you see. One of the first things you see, like he he pays a guy off in the very beginning to introduce him to a widow at a funeral so that he can try to represent her in some wrongful death case or something. So he's an ambulance okay. chaser kind of a guy, right? Gotcha. So you see that. Then there's a then you cut to to a newspaper with the obituaries, and he's got. He's crossing some things out and he's circling other things, Mm. right? There's also uh, a shot glass of whiskey Mm. on that paper and there's a donut Mm. and it it is, I go, I, and I ask people, I go, what's going on? They go, well, you see that is an ambulance teacher. I go, yeah, you see that. What else do you see? And they, for a while, they're like, I don't know. It's like, um, he's, he's having a drink. I go, yeah, but what, when is he having a drink? Like, oh, in the, when do you eat donuts Hmm. in the morning, him drinking whiskey in the morning tells you he's an alcoholic, Hmm. right? Right. It's a beautiful shot. No, (laughs) no DP would ever point it out as a beautiful shot, Yeah, but it's gorgeous. Wow. Yeah. It's gorgeous. It's one of my favorite shots in all of movies because of the elegance of it. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's using the camera to inform the story. Right. But then there are probably countless times where you're watching other things where you're like, sure, this cool drone shot or this cool epic, whatever it is that you think looks really good. It actually was kind of pointless. Right. Or distracting sometimes distracts from the story Mm, because I want to see this cool thing. You know, that happens a lot working with, if I'm working with a director or something, sometimes they, they have a thing they want in the movie. I'm like, yeah. I know you want that, yeah, but that doesn't help you. But right. they think it does. They think if they have enough cool things and they put them in a bag that shake them up, they'll have a good story and it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, that's how most bad things are made. Right. I think, I mean, yeah, zooming back out, even from movies, I think for creators, that's just 
real right now too. I think, yes. and I'm guilty of this all the time where I have a wide range of tastes and mm-hmm. design elements and all kinds of stuff that for me, I find that are, that are cool and that it's like, yeah, let's just throw it in to see if it works. But right. it's like, man, I'm really doing my, my story a disservice, even just as a creator, whatever my story, if you, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but just like you're doing yourself a disservice by just, to your point, throwing all of your tastes and interests and all this, all of your opinions, your feelings, your personal tastes and preferences into a bag and shaking it up and expecting other people to care about that. Right. It's a very bad plan. There's also, there's a story about Rodin doing a sculpture where, um, I forget the sculpture. It's a real sculpture. He really did this. And uh, he made this sculpture. He wanted to know what people thought. So he asked an apprentice, what do you think about this? And, and the apprentice went on and on about the hands on the sculpture, like, oh, my God, they're so beautiful. They're like they're alive, you know, and mm. went on and on about it. He asked somebody else and they said the same thing. And they asked, he asked somebody else to the same thing. So he cut the hands off the sculpture because mm. it was distracting from the rest of the sculpture. Wow. The hands were distracting. So he cut them off. Right. Yeah. Almost no artists do that. Right. Yeah. But almost no artists are Rodin. Right. That's true. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's editing. Right. Yeah. Right. 100%. That's editing. Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, just to, to open myself up a little bit to people listening, like when I first heard you talk about armature and editing and these things, that was around the time when I had, you know, I was working on another show earlier this year for you, Brian, you don't know this probably, but to give you context earlier this year, I was working on another show and it literally was kind of talking about everything. Mm-hmm. I was talking about, social issues, politics, creativity, business, all these like mismatched things, things I'm interested in. Sure. And no one cared. (laughs) Basically. (laughs) And there's no, because there's no story there. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like if you were, if I were to say, ask anybody, Hey, what is this podcast about? No one could tell their friend what it was. Right. It wasn't clear at all. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is, is when I started thinking more about like, well, what's my armature from my, creative project, the podcast I want to make, the story I want to tell. I did I took me a few days. It wasn't easy. It took me a lot of work oh, to yeah. really drill down into myself to say, what do I care about and what am I trying to say? And it was now and I'll say it now. My armature for this podcast is to help creators defeat insecurity and make something cool with their life. Okay. And cool. like yeah. and that feels like very clear to me of like now everything I do is informed by that. It feels like so clarifying where it's just like, cool, that's, that makes my job so easy because I'm not reinventing the wheel every single week trying to come up with something new. But that process of creating that armature and finding that, that um, the point, I guess, yes. to what you're saying was really hard. That's, that's a really daunting process. It is. And that's one of the reasons that people will avoid it. Yeah. But it, it, Here's what happens. You can do your heavy lifting at the beginning of the process or at the end of the process. Mm. If you do your heavy lifting at the beginning of the process, it's actually a lot easier because what's happening is you have an, if you're doing any creative thing at all, you have an infinite number of choices and possibilities. Infinite. Having a point takes it from infinite to finite. Well, I can only do these things, right? It eliminates all the million things you could pick yeah. and gets it down. Maybe it gets it down to a hundred things, but at least that's only a hundred things, you know, you know, which is a lot less than an infinite number of things, you know, you know, definitely, you know, but maybe it gets down to 50 or maybe it gets down to three, you know, right. Um, The more you can drill down and eliminate choices. Hmm. Um, And in fact, I think, and this is the other thing you have to humble yourself enough to to become, you have to surrender and say that this thing is bigger than me. Mm. And a lot of artists won't do that. Mm. And once you do that, what happens is you are open to the things that will help you express that armature without imposing your will on top of it. So you'll feel Mm. more like you're making discoveries rather than making decisions. Okay. Oh, that's the perfect thing that this should be. Oh, that's the thing that it should be. And it right. won't feel like invention. Mm. And I think that sometimes robs people of the sort of dopamine hit they get right, from yeah. feeling like they invented something. Right. And so they'd rather feel like, ah, I just came up with this crazy thing, you know, okay, but it doesn't really work. I think that sometimes the 
of the chemicals that get released when we are creating the thing like, well, like a DP who's really into cool shots or whatever. I'll put cool in quotes. <laughs> the dopamine or whatever that's getting released when they do that, they think that translates to the audience. Right. Right. It's like, no, that's the drug you're addicted to. Right. right. It yeah. doesn't translate necessarily to the audience. Hmm. And uh, people don't, they, they're like, how could it not? Because my brain's lighting up with chemicals. And it's like, well, right. yes, that's your brain, you right. know? And uh, yeah, a lot of people think that, that it's contagious and it isn't necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So how does a storyteller get good at editing? How do you get better at this? Like, do you, how do you think through that? Is it just purely like, I mean, I guess we've, we've kind of been talking about this whole time. Does it hang off the armature? Does it serve the story or not? Yeah, that's it. Does it serve yeah. the story? If it doesn't, there's no reason for it. Yeah. Um, but it is painful to, what is that? Kill your darlings. Mm -hmm. famous, that's the whole point, right? Well, yeah. You have to understand Rodan cut off those hands. Mm. Right. Right. You know, and I think that that's as much of why Rodan is Rodan as the sculptures themselves. Yeah. What he left out, what you, you know, I, I take pictures and what I realized about pictures was all the picture is when you take a photograph, the only thing it is, is a frame. Hmm. That's all. Because the frame is eliminating everything you don't want people to see, right? Mm. And basically, it's a finger pointing saying, look at this and only this. Right. Right? So a lot of photographers will say this, and it's true. What you leave out is just as important as what you put in. Right. That's true of so much creativity. Right. Right. And so I, when I take photos now, I go, only thing here is the frame. That's the mm. only thing I'm doing. I'm not doing anything else. Yeah. The, the frame is the art. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any stories of you? Cause you've, you've been doing this for so long and you've, you've done it in many different arenas too. Mm -hmm. Do you have any times that the armature or getting that the point down was really difficult for you? Like, and, and is, is it always something where you, Maybe you feel like I want to tell a story about blank and then you just start there. Or is it, is there toil involved? Like for me, I felt like, man, I'm really trying to wrestle this down kind of like, what am I really trying to say? And it felt very hard. And I'm not sure if that's weird or good or bad or the other. Do you have any experiences like that where, or maybe it's working with clients too, where you kind of have to wrestle down somebody else's idea into what it is. Like, yeah, that's, any that's like harder that? for me. An armature can come pretty quickly. Yeah. But it's a matter of, um, it's a muscle that you mm. either have exercised or you haven't, right? So mm. it, it's, if you think of it that way, you just go, well, I just, this is my first day at the gym. Of course it's hard, right? <laughs> you know, right? right? Yeah. And so, yeah, it, it can be difficult. And I'm not mm. saying it's always easy, by the way, but I generally start with an armature for the most part. Yeah. So I know I want to say something. And if you start thinking, if that becomes part of your creative process, then it doesn't become the thing you're, you, because that's what sparks you. Sure. Yeah. Right? right. Instead of, uh, this cool thing that you saw, you, you'll go, Oh, that's a really good way to illustrate this idea. And I believe that idea. And so, you right. know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so you, you'll start thinking in those terms or often maybe I'll get a random idea and there is no armature. Then I, I think, Oh, I don't have a story. I just have a random idea. It's not right. a story until I have an armature. And sometimes I will sit on that idea for years. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, if I have to, because sometimes it's an assignment, I can find it. I can find a reason to tell the story. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you, you can do it, but understand it's a muscle. It's a different way of thinking. And yeah. what I find is that I don't, I actually don't do very much editing because mm. I'm not creating things I don't need. Wow. So you're just going, you're going in ready knowing where it's going. And yes, you're not, yeah. you're not having to go back and trim, trim stuff. Cause you're not. You yeah. I mean, occasionally, but not almost to the point where you wouldn't notice like uh, one draft from another. Hmm. I wouldn't even call them drafts. Like, wow. uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, but I've taught students how to do it and they can do it. I, I think that, writing is rewriting it's not necessarily true mm. um it's not necessarily true neil gaiman who's great yeah said uh the second draft 
I'm paraphrasing, but he said the second draft is making it look like you knew where you're going with the first draft or something like that. And I Mm -hmm. just think, or you could know what you're doing. Like, you know know where you're going from the beginning. You could know that that's not an unknowable thing. Mm, Right. Right. But you know, some people work that way, but uh, you know, because I'm dyslexic, I find that actually I would put money on Alfred Hitchcock being dyslexic. Hmm. I would put, I would put money on it. He has a lot, he had a lot of dyslexic strategies and he thought like a dyslexic. There's a certain way dyslexics think. And I think dyslexics are always thinking inside out. So they they start with the inside and, and work out from there. I just think that is the way, like Steve Jobs was dyslexic. And he said, people think design is how something works or what something looks like. That's what he said. The design Mm -hmm. is what something looks like, but it's really how it works. Right. That sounds just dyslexic to me. Like he was dyslexic and it's like, yes, that's right. Design. Hmm. So any kind of artistic design, any kind of story design, it's like, well, how does it work? Right. That's the design. What happens on the outside is it because of what's happening on the inside. Hmm. Right. Yeah. And you feel like the, the having dyslexia that informs because you've, you've had to think that way. Just Yes. And so, and so you think that, but the other thing is, at least for me, so, oh, what I was going to say is like, one of the things about Hitchcock is that he could pre-visualize a movie, which is uh, uh, one of the dyslexic strength is being able to pre-visualize stuff. Okay. The problem with that is a lot of people can't do it. So they think you can't really do it either. So, so, so right. (laughs) Right. you know what I mean? They are like, Uh. are you sure? And then they have to spend, you know, a year or something working on the movie and come back to where you started because they couldn't see it as clearly. It's a frustrating thing. But Hitchcock, you know, would say that shooting a movie was the most boring thing for him because he already made the movie in his head. He knew how everything fit together and how everything worked. Yeah. I had a friend who was working with Spielberg on something, um, doing storyboards for something. And he's like, man, that guy just knew how to solve problems. It was crazy. Like he, mm. he could go, this shot needs to be this, this shot needs to be that. And he could just do it. And he said it was always better. He was always right. And he's dyslexic. Wow. And so, but for me, because, and this is one of the reasons I started thinking about separating words from storytelling. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of dyslexic writers. Agatha Christie was dyslexic. Um, James O. Brooks, who has written a bunch of movies and uh, big deal TV shows and stuff. He's mm-hmm. dyslexic. What dyslexia does for me or did for me was as a kid, it, it, it couldn't feel worse. But right. Because words were kind of my enemy, I wanted to be telling stories, but words were a barrier between me and what I was trying to do. Hmm, Yeah. Right. Because in school, at least when I was in school, they didn't care so much about your content as they did about your spelling and punctuation and all those things that dyslexics are bad at. Right. So you could have amazing content. No one cared. But if you were a good speller that, you know, then, oh, well, then you're a genius. Right. Even if you couldn't write something that mattered, right, 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 right. right yeah. And that's really frustrating for dyslexics. But sure. what it what it did for me is it made me, uh, because the words were a barrier, because spelling was a thing, because all those things were a thing, and even my handwriting's bad and all that, yeah, which is pretty normal for dyslexics. So what I did was I had to get it right in my head first. Interesting. Yeah. Right. And then write it down. Right. So, but if you don't have that issue, if you can type at the speed of thought, like I still can't type, I can write books and blah, blah, blah. I can't type. I I hunt and peck. Can't type. Okay. Yeah. I'm pretty fast with these two fingers, but, 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 uh, (laughs) right. You know, uh, but you know, spelling is not an automatic process. I have to think about where every, you know what I mean? That's even if I knew how to type, it would go just as slow, slowly because I have to think. Than this, than mm-hmm. this, than this, than this, than this. It's not automatic. But if you can type or write at the speed of thought, then I suppose you can just do this sort of, you know, vomit of words and then come back and peel it back into a story, right? Yeah. Or the things that you want. But that's not really an option for me in the same way. Right. Yeah. And so um, I think that writing is rewriting was something somebody who wasn't dyslexic said. Definitely. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Well, and I think to your point, like I think a lot of, you know, people who I read about writing from 
there's a lot of people saying almost basically the opposite of what you're suggesting of just like, just get it all out of your head and then edit, 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 edit all down. But they're not starting with an armature necessarily. Right. And so that's, that's kind of the key here that I, I know are, we're circling it a lot, but I think that that's, what's so crazy to think about it is if you kind of understand the point before you start, you won't have to edit down as much because everything, everything you write will matter. Right. I, I give, you, yeah, I give yeah. you an example, going back to the wizard of Oz. And the Over the Rainbow song, actually, Hmm. Um, which was almost cut from the movie. I I think I know why it was almost cut. You know, it's MGM. MGM was was the biggest studio, the most successful studio when they were big. I mean, MGM never closed. Like, 24 hours a day, there was somebody working at MGM, like, making costumes, building sets. Because they, you know, back then, uh, a studio put out a movie a week. They didn't make a movie in a week, they, but they released sure. a movie, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was a big deal. And yeah. to work at MGM was the huge deal. So uh, when they screened The Wizard of Oz, Louis B. Mayer was the, ran the studio. And all the songwriters tried to convince him to cut the song. Like, that song doesn't help the story, It blah, blah, blah. And they tried to convince him to cut it, and they almost convinced him. And I mm-hmm. think they knew. They're smart. They knew how good the song was. Right. Right. It's like, well, wait, I'm a songwriter. I can't write a song that good. We got to get that. We got, we got to, we, right. I think right. that that's what that was about because there's mm-hmm. no way to say it doesn't advance the story. There's no, and they said they made all those arguments. It's like they knew what they heard. They're too, right. they were too good at their jobs not to understand how mm-hmm. good that song was. Yeah. So, but anyway, when they were doing that song, it's really fascinating. So they, again, they didn't have the song. They didn't know what they were going to do. And there's no rainbow. There's no mention of a rainbow in the book, Hmm. but all that in the book, if you read the book, they talk a lot about, he talks about how Kansas is so gray. Hmm. Like it's just gray, gray. And he he talks about it a lot. And so they were like, well, wait a minute. If Kansas is so gray and colorless, the only color she would really see is the rainbow. Hmm. And so then they write that song. Right. The director goes, that's great. Love that song. That makes sense. So why don't we make Kansas in black and white? Right. And Oz in color. That's not a decision made because it's cool. Right. That was a decision made because it actually helped to the story. Mm. Right. Right. It actually came out of the story. Right. Right. A discovery versus an invention right right and what's it, the point of the wizard of oz uh what do you think it is <laughs> well i've actually heard you say the answer oh you so actually I, heard I, me say so, yeah so I, I won't i won't spoil it but okay so the, the point of the wizard well most people uh when i'm teaching will say that um the point is there's no place like home right they'll say mm. that's what it is so there's no place like home but that isn't, that isn't what it is. Hmm. Um, because you have to look at what the story proves. Look at the story math. How do, how, what adds up? What, what's the math here? What it, what it's proving is that you may already have what you're looking for. And how it proves that is through not just Dorothy, but through all the characters in the story, right? Hmm. So the scarecrow doesn't think he has a brain, but has a brain the whole movie and is the only character who comes up with plans. Mm. because he's the brains. So he's got all the plans, right? You know, I got a plan how to get in there. I got Cause he's the brains, but doesn't know it. Uh, the tin man is always crying because he has a heart and doesn't know it. Mm. And the lion is courageous and doesn't know it. Right. And so over and over again, what gets demonstrated, um, what gets dramatized. And I'll talk about why I think that that's an important, uh, word and we shouldn't misuse it. Mm. But, what gets dramatized is that, oh, they already have what they're looking for. The way it's contextualized for Dorothy is there's no place like home. Right. But that's because she had everything she was looking for already. Right. You know, the same friends, the same witch, right? Yeah. Everything, right? She had everything she needed. She just didn't mm. know it. Mm. She even had Professor Marvel, who is the wizard, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, uh, she already had everything. Mm. So, um, the, look at what the story proves, not what the character says necessarily. What does it prove? 
Uh, so good. Such yeah. a good distinction. Yeah. And, you know, and the movies lasted, you know, 1939. You know yeah. what I mean? It's lasted this oh, yeah. long. It's yeah. still the most seen movie in the world, I think. Right. Yeah. Touch on drama. The use of oh, drama. Yeah. yeah. So here's the thing. This is why I think the, the word, it's it the way we use it is not only wrong, but I think it doesn't help people uh, tell good stories. So mm. drama, the word drama means to do. Mm. So when you are dramatizing something, you are demonstrating it. Mm. You aren't preaching or telling it to people. You are demonstrating it. So in The Wizard of Oz, they dramatize that the scarecrow has brains by showing you by demonstrating that he has brains mm, right that's dramatization it has nothing to do with being serious versus being funny right and mm. right so once because that's comedy and tragedy but they're both drama because right you can you they're can demonstrating you can yeah. demonstrate right right um and so i don't like those definitions because it's confusing about what drama is and what you're supposed to be doing mm, right you are supposed to be demonstrating your idea. Yeah. And so um, I, I feel like I, I want to take the word back and say, you're not using it correctly. <laughs> right. Um, no, that's a, such a good distinction. Yeah. 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 The use of, of, of demonstrating is so good. I'm curious, like, I think that there's a lot of uh, maybe oversimplified, but maybe that's the point of, of we've talked a lot about armature. We've talked about maybe the, the point of stories, but I guess there is there like a structure that you tend to follow pretty closely, like act one, act two, act three. For me, I've always thought about it as like introducing a character and then uh, character confronts problem and then character is then transformed by said problem or something that kind of feels like the story structure in my head. I don't write stories professionally, so that might be uh, crazy sounding. Uh, but is there like a structure to this that's like something that's like maybe repeatable, simple to understand? Or is it kind of a little bit more free than that? There's probably not maybe a three step process in the same way. I don't know. Is, is there anything to that? Yeah, uh, it's um, it's actually pretty simple. Hmm. So, yes, it's pretty simple. So there's a couple of ways to think about it. You can talk about three act structure and you can break it down, but it, it's simpler even than that. It's still three, mm. but it's simpler than that. Okay. And it is proposal, argument, conclusion. Those are your three acts. Mm. So, so your proposal is, is something like some things are more important than money. Well, your first act, if you have to prove that to the audience or teach that to the character, then you, probably you're going to start with a character who has a lot of money. Right. You already know that, right? That's already made decision. And also if you're proving some things are more important than money, you also know that you have to, in that first act, show how important money is to that character. Right. And how he values that money over people mm. or over something else. Right. So it's already telling you what to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, how rich can I make this guy? How can I, show how he's spending his money or not spending his money or whatever it is. Right. It's telling you what to do. Right. Right. Probably in a story like that, that character might lose their money or not have access to their money. Now you're mm. in act two. You had your thesis. Now you have your antithesis. Or their spouse leaves them because they're so obsessed with money and work or something or like something, that. Something. Right. Yeah. But you have their, you know, you have your, yes. Yeah, so you have your thesis, mm -hmm. right? Yep. You have your antithesis take that money away or take something away, do whatever you have to do. Right. right. In act three, usually stories are circular. So you come around to the beginning again, but this time it's different because of what happened in the middle. Right. So sure. when you get to act three, you restore things mm. and you go now, given the experience of act two, who is this person? Right. Right. And, and that's so simple. It is. <laughs> I've been smiling since you've been talking. Cause like, this is so much better than what I thought. It's so much clearer. Uh, and you make it sound so, and it is very simple when you put it that way. No, that's so good. Yeah. It's a simple, it's not, it's not people make it difficult. They want it to be difficult. They mm. think that if it's too simple, how can it be good or all these things? But the truth of the matter is the best things, the things that last 
what what I have seen about with classics, classics. I don't mean classics that critics say are classics. I mean classics that an audience yes. returns to. Right. Like It's a Wonderful Life or something like that. Yes. Classics are relentlessly focused. Mm. They are relentlessly focused. Mm. They're very simple, usually. Yeah. That's um, so brave, though. I think it's that's... So, it's really brave. When I when I think of that for cre- like the modern creator, like zooming back out to, to people listening, and for me, it takes a lot of courage to really kind of tune out all the excess noise and be relentlessly focused. Like that takes bravery in a way because it's so easy to just get swept up in distractions or even th- even serving the audience versus serving uh, the story or what you're trying to s- like things like that where you're like, well, people might think this is cool or that. But it's like, that's actually still not helping because you're not focused on the story anymore. It's just, it's, it takes a, a level of bravery to be, you know, to make, <laughs> to make those cuts and to make those edits. I think really it's pretty simple. And I, and I feel like I'm learning as we're talking, but just like making those edits, even if it's your preference, that's what it takes to make something really lasting and great. Yep. It's really yeah. good. And I think too, like, I guess the, like the last portion of this conversation I want to get into is, you know, you, We've been talking a lot about like almost movies, scripts, longer form stories. But I think the work you you do with Belief Agency, mm-hmm. it's a, it's very focused on brands. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm curious, maybe now we can take everything we've just talked about. Can we kind of paint that onto a brand and how brand uses uh, would use these same tactics and structures and things like that for their storytelling and how to connect with their audience and things like that? Like, how do you approach that generally? Well, they have the same thing, right? They have an armature, essentially, mm. which would be their b- belief, which was developed actually uh, by Jesse Bryan at the Belief Agency um, to dig down and find out what a company's belief is. We do these things called belief sessions, mm. and it, it's a it's a process. <laughs> and uh, but sometimes people think they're supposed to have a certain belief. And so they put something on and that's not honest. So it's getting Mm. drilling down to really what a company really believes. Mm. And then we find ways to dramatize that. Okay. Right. Like, okay. If you believe that, um, for instance, I didn't have anything to do with this, but um, I, I think I can talk about this. I don't know if I get in trouble, I get in trouble, but I think I can talk about this. So, um, there was, um, uh, a food bank that was a client Mm. and their belief had to do with every person deserves dignity or something like that. Mm. Jesse would know Jesse worked on it, Uh, but, but every, uh, something like that. And, you know, it can be embarrassing uh, and feel shameful for people to go to a food bank. I mean, I was a poor kid. Mm -hmm. And they're set up in a way that's just very cold and, you know, it's not a fun place to be Mm -hmm. and it can be bad for kids. They don't feel like other kids or whatever. Once this food bank understood that was their belief system, then they knew they had, so it was like, oh, so what were were you saying? Everybody deserves dignity. How do we make it so that this place has dignity? So what they did is they set up their food bank exactly like a grocery store. Mm. So that the kids don't see any difference. Yeah. People don't see any different pe- difference. They, they, so it, every decision gets made. Oh, well, how, is this, is this saying that people deserve dignity? Yeah. Right. So it tells you everything to do, just like an armature in a store. That's so good. Yeah. I, I think that's so clarifying and so, such a cool story, too. I mean, yeah. Are there like any, like maybe let's zoom out to, to an example like of a brand that you you look at and you're like, wow, they just have nailed it. And when it comes to this, like armature story, all that stuff relating to their brand. Like what's what's one that maybe most people would know and understand? Nike. I agree. Yeah, Nike. They just cut through the noise with everything. It's very clear. They know what they're trying to do. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they know. If you if you have a body, you're an athlete. Mm. That's their thing. Yeah. Right. Which means they can have spots that have athletes, but it also means they can have spots with regular people. Right. Right. There was one ad with a, um, a kid running an overweight kid running. And it was just one shot of this kid running with some narration, but 
if you have a body, you're an athlete. It was so moving. I remember that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's the power of knowing what you're trying to say. Right. Yeah. Right. That you can say it in a single shot. Mm. That's one shot. That spot. Yeah. Right. It's, it, it, it's like that shot I was talking about from the verdict. What are you yes. trying to say? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you can do it all in one shot. You don't need to cut around. You don't need anything fancy. It doesn't need to look cool. None of that stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So good. Yeah. It's just about stay. It's just about adhering to that armature, to that point, to that belief, to the exclusion of all else. Yes. Um, I, I like to think of it like this. So I was reading an interview years ago with, I'm a big fan of Ben Burt and Ben Burt it designed all the sound uh, for star Wars and a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for people. This is one of those things too, that if you, if you came along after a new hope after star Wars, you have no idea how amazing and how groundbreaking, even the sound of that movie is right. that, you know, go watch a science fiction film made before that and listen to the way their blasters or laser guns sound. Mm -hmm. Right. Or listen to the way spaceships sound or listen, like, it changed everything. Mm. It's now it's normal, right? Right. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. You know, but it wasn't normal. Even the sound was, you know, something special. And all anyway, I'm a big fan of Ben Burt. I met him once, Ben Burt, and I, I think I scared him because I was such a fanboy. Like, yeah. he's a cool guy. <laughs> like, I was, I was working on something at Pixar, and he was there, and I'm like, it's Ben Burt, and I, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure I scared him. So, yes. <laughs> so, I've been there. I've been yeah. there myself. So, yeah, um, that's awesome. Yeah, uh, but I thought, you know what? I'm never going to meet Ben Burt again, so of he's going to have to yeah. hear him how cool I think he is. Exactly. So, so, which is actually a big no-no. They don't want you to do that when you're there, but I'm like, ah. So, <laughs> right. so, yeah. But anyway, I was reading an interview with him, and he was talking about the sound design for Raiders of the Lost Ark. And he said, there's, uh, there's some arrows in that movie in, mm -hmm. uh, in that Indiana Jones movie, there's some arrows that are being shot and he's a, he's also a film sound historian. So he can hear a phone in a movie and know, wow. Oh, that was a Warner brothers phone from this era. <laughs> like he knows yeah. like all the sounds, yeah. a, a scream, a gunshot. He knows where all that stuff came from. Okay. And he really liked the arrow sound effects in uh, the 1930s version of Robin Hood, which is a Warner Brothers mm -hmm. movie. And, and the guy who did that was a guy named Treg Brown. Treg Brown did also did all the sound effects for all the Looney Tunes stuff. Mm -hmm. So he was a big fan of Treg Brown. And anyway, he was like, I got to make my arrow sound like Treg Brown's. And so, you know, he was recording, he was making arrows and shooting and trying to record the sound of arrows going through the air. What he discovered was a really good arrow doesn't actually make any noise mm. because right. a really good arrow is designed to not have friction. Right. 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 <laughs> right. And what I feel like having an armature is or a belief system that you're adhering to is like having an arrow with no noise mm. that mm. it, yeah. that, that it goes with, no, it hits its target because it has no friction. Yes. It's not fighting anything. Right. That's so good. I think maybe to, maybe I think that's such a good analogy. Maybe to close out, I wonder like you said that there's like the belief process that you take brands through and things like that. We obviously can't or won't get into the, all that, but I'm curious, like maybe, maybe for a creator who's trying to figure that out, like what are some of the questions you would say that are good to ask yourself, or maybe you're running a brand or trying to start a brand? Like what are some good ways or some good prompts. Like, what are the questions you start off with? Maybe well, when you're trying to figure I, that out. I, I, it's different for me. I, I would. Uh, you might want to have Jesse on the show because Jesse. I would love to. Yeah, yeah because it's really his process. Okay. Um, my when I come in, usually I'm there to help them break down story. I usually give them the idea or the concept for armature, so then they go, "Oh, this is really useful," and I'll show certain clips from movies and things so mm. they can see like, Oh, that's how that's used. I see. So they can see the right. importance of it. And so also if we're making for um, a company, if we're making like a documentary or something there, there's a company we work for sometimes that we make these documentaries for them and they've all been trained in story. And that's really interesting because when we are going through the editing process with them, a particular documentary, 
they might have a suggestion, but because they understand armature, we can say, well, is that helping our armature? And they'll say, oh, well, no, it kind of isn't. And mm. so there's no, it's a real, I will say this, what I have found since I came to the leaf agency and, and what I've been told because I wasn't there before, right. Right. Mm. Is that having the idea of an armature and I, I see it, it's amazing to watch if everybody's trained. I mean, I train everybody there in store. What happens is the discussions we have about something we, we're creating are never personal, mm. right? Because we're just trying to adhere to the armature. Does yeah. that idea help or hurt us? Right. Nobody's like rejecting ideas because they don't like that person or accepting ideas because they do like whatever it is. It's does it exactly. help us? Yeah. And, and it's, um, it's amazing because it allows everybody to sort of check their ego at the door yeah. and just solve the problem. Mm. And that's really helpful. Things move more smoothly, more quickly and with no resistance, no right. friction. Right? right. So I will say that, but I, I would say that when I work with a company, usually my job is to give them some background in story. So they have an idea of what we're doing. And I also think that can make the belief process um, an easier process for them in some ways because yeah. they understand the value right. of knowing what you want to say. Sure. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, I, I really think we've kind of hit a lot of the points, I guess I'm thinking about, you know, even for me or for other creators listening, like, I guess the real key is finding the points yeah. and then, and then building around that versus the other way. Right. And but you have to dig deep for the point. You can't pick a point. Right. It has to mean That's something good. to you. Yeah. It has to mean something like there's things you believe. Here's the thing about survival information and mm -hmm. passing on survival information. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what people will say is, well, um, who am I to tell people how to live or my philosophy or blah, blah, blah. Who am I? Well, you're a human being who mm -hmm. lives on the planet. Right. And if you are a human being who lives on the planet, you have survived something. Yes, you have, mm. right? You've survived a crappy childhood. Or you've survived uh, an abusive relationship or you've survived. There's a million things, right? Mm. <laughs> right. A yeah. million things. You don't think about them. It's just your life. But right. those things taught you something, mm. right? Right. And if you tap in, you know, on some level, you know what you believe. So ask yourself what you really believe, what really matters to you. What have you learned? Uh, from the worst experiences of your life. What have you learned? Yes. Well, that information is valuable to somebody. Yes. Invaluable to yes. somebody. So, and in that way, I think of storytelling as a service. It's a service job. Hmm. What am I giving to people? Not how cool am I? And, you know, I, look, I like seeing my book on a bookshelf like anybody else. You know what I mean? But yeah. the things I am most proud of in the creative process is how much I get out of the way. My ego has nothing to do with what I created, but how much I was able to step aside and let the armature do the work. Mm. Like that's what I'm proud of. It also, it's a strange thing. It gives you kind of confidence in your work. That's interesting mm. because you, because in a way you didn't do it. <laughs> right. So you can you discover you didn't yeah. decide. Yeah. So it's like, well, that's what it's supposed to be. Don't get mad at me. Right. right. Like it's this really interesting thing yeah. that I think sometimes uh, appears to be uh, a cockiness or an overconfidence, mm. but it's, it's a confidence in the process, not right. necessarily in yourself. Right. Oh, um, Brian, that's so good. So good, man. Thanks. Thanks so much for being on. I mean, I, I think everyone should pick up a copy of your book. Where, where, where should people, where should I direct people to come check out more of what you're up to? Uh, well, they can, uh, go to the podcast. You are a storyteller. So if they look at Brian McDonald and you are a storyteller, they'll find the podcast yes. anywhere and you can watch it. You can listen to it, you know, on anything. Uh, so there's that there's the books. Invisible Ink is the most popular book. Uh, there's the golden theme. Um, there's ink spots. There's my graphic novel, old souls. I have another graphic novel coming out. Uh, I hope next year. Um, oh, that's awesome. Uh, called land of the dead and it's all about it's well it's a non-fiction sort of graphic novel so it's all about um how characters in ancient stories all often went to the land of the dead to gain wisdom and how we still use that in stories today but we don't recognize it and so it's all about that 
Oh my um, gosh. That yes. sounds cool. Yes. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that, that'll be out. So look for that. I'm not sure when. I wish I could tell you when. I don't have a release date yet from Macmillan, but hopefully we'll find out soon. But yeah. uh, Invisible Link is the most popular book and talks about the stuff we we're talking about today. And Golden Theme is my favorite book. And so, um, yeah. So those that's, I think, where you would find anything. Awesome. Great. Yeah. Everyone go check those out. I'll have some links in the show notes and yeah, Brian, I, I just feel like I've learned so much from you and I really appreciate you, uh, you, you, you sharing your time and all your, your wisdom. It's been really, really fun. And I would love to have you back on to talk about the new book when it comes out. There'll be, there'll be a good conversation on its own. Oh, that, that would be great, Alex. Thanks for having me on. Um, and, uh, yeah. And saying such very uh, flattering things about my work and about me. It's really. Um, oh, no, it's it's yeah. well-deserved. Well-deserved. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, thanks again, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode and want to get more of these conversations sent directly to your inbox, you can head over to alexhug.com and sign up for my newsletter. And as always, please go leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts for the show. That helps spread the word. And last but not least, this episode was edited and produced by Josh Perez. And if you're looking for help with your podcast, Josh is your guy. He's a great producer and an even better human being. So please get in touch with him at justjoshperez.com. I'll be back soon with another new episode. So until then, let's go make something cool.